Welcome to The Art of Charm. I'm Jordan Harbinger. The Art of Charm brings together the best coaches in the industry to teach you guys how to crush it in life, love, and at work. Imagine having a mix of experienced mentors teaching you their expertise, packing decades of research, testing, and tough lessons into a concise curriculum. We've created one of the premier men's lifestyle programs available anywhere, and it's free. This is the show we wish we had a decade ago. This show is about you, and we're here to help you become the best man you can be in every area of your life. Make sure to stay up to date with everything going on here and get some killer free ebooks as well as drills and exercises that'll help you become more charismatic and confident by signing up for the newsletter at theartofcharm.com. If you're new to the show but you want to know more about what we teach here at The Art of Charm, listen to the toolbox at theartofcharmpodcast.com slash toolbox. That's where you'll get the fundamentals of dating and attraction such as body language, eye contact, vocal tonality, all that stuff that's more important than you might think. We've got boot camps running every single month here in California. Details at theartofcharm.com, and I'm looking forward to meeting all of you guys here at The Art of Charm. Enjoy. Today we're talking with super charismatic physical trainer Elliot Hulls. We're going to talk about why it's important to become strong, not just physically but emotionally. How do we become the strongest version of ourselves and how much of our intelligence is actually found in our bodies, literally. We're also going to talk about finding our own path to strength, how your mind and body are inseparable and actually kind of the same thing, how to breathe for real, and exercises to stretch out muscular tension that we carry all the time that impedes proper breathing. We're also going to discuss how the Eastern mind and Western mind differ, not too woo-woo though, don't worry, and how we can absorb some of the lessons that will make us stronger emotionally. Last but not least, body psychology therapy, mattress humping for a healthy lifestyle, and emotional clarity. Enjoy. You know, you seem like a well-mannered gentleman type, but the photograph that I got from your PR people is kind of terrifying. You probably have the capacity to scare small children. It's kind of funny. At first, I was like, this guy looks like a professional wrestler or something, you know, because obviously you're built really big, but also you've got that natural charisma talking right at somebody. You're like in their face in your videos. Yeah. I saw the, your strength camp, your gym, and I saw the beer kegs, and I got excited, but I'm guessing they're not full of beer, so that kind of took the wind out of my sails as well. <sighs> no, nah, sand and water. Sand and water? Yeah. How much does a sand-filled keg weigh? I mean, that must be... Well, we just did a competition where keg carries was one of the events, and we filled them up to about 175 pounds each. You can load them all the way up to about 300 pounds, you know? Wow. I don't know if I could move anything that heavy. Yeah, well, you can build up to it, man. That's the whole point, right? Yeah, that's the point. So why do you have such a passion to become stronger? You know, it's one of these things where I've always had a natural gift towards and a propensity towards strength and power. I kind of have been that way since I was a kid. I was born that way. So I really embrace sports that required strength, power, speed. And of course, I trained that way in order to get better at football, to get better at strongman, all the wrestling, all the things that I did. So um, I really enjoyed the training as much as I enjoyed the sports. So I decided to become a coach. Yeah. Now tell us when you got started, because you got started when you were really little. Well, my uncle was a, in the beginning, he was a martial artist. So when I was about four years old, he was heavily invested in Northern Shaolin Kung Fu. And he was a black belt. He was an instructor. And, uh, and he come over, he lived with us for a little while and he would do backflips and chop bricks and he would do all types of wild stunts in front of me as a four year old. So, uh, I wanted to do it too. Like any four year old would, if he saw a man doing backflips in his, in his living room. So at that point, he just threw us on the floor and started teaching us how to do push ups and sit ups and climbing ropes. I mean, I've been training ever since. That's amazing. When did you figure out you were stronger than all of your friends? Kindergarten, when I could do a push-up and nobody else could. Right, yeah, they just fall flat on their face. Pretty much, you know, the whole sagging body thing where, uh, you know, the hips are on the floor. I, I, I took it for granted because me and my brothers got real strong real fast at, at a young age. And then when I went to school, and I actually remember this because it was my first sense of being empowered, my first, like, self-esteem boost. It was like, holy shit, none of these kids can do anything I can do. I, I was faster. I could do push-ups. I could do sit-ups. And, um, and I guess that molded my character. 
Yeah, as it would for anyone, for sure. I remember when I was younger, we had a gym class and they were trying to get us to do pull-ups, but we were all too young. I mean, we were probably in like first grade or something like that. So they just had us hanging on to the pull-up bar and I didn't really get what was going on. So I hung on for a minute and 30 seconds or something insane and got bored. And it turned out that I had like beaten the school record by like a full, (laughs) you know, 20 plus seconds or something like that. And it's funny because I, I'm definitely not that strong right now. I mean, which is largely a result of lifestyle and stuff like that versus genetics. But it's kind of funny to see that the genetics were there, still are there, buried under, as I like to say, the six pack that I have is in the refrigerator. Uh Um, but why is it so important to you to become stronger, both mentally and physically? I mean, you have what we call different levels of strength and, and I definitely want to get into that. Uh, but why is it so important to you to stay that way? Yeah, you were stronger when you were little, so was I. Why did you stay that way? Well, the very first thing you got to understand is that I've come to use the word strength and the idea of growing stronger as a metaphor for Mm self-actualization, personal development. And because I came into my own and I began presenting myself to the world, if you will, through the medium of strength, that has, it has always been my calling card. I was a strength coach, I was a strength athlete, and I own a gym, and so on and so forth. But as I've evolved, and my message has evolved, association with strength, and what it actually means when I say it has evolved. And when I say grow stronger and become a stronger version of yourself, it means on multiple different layers, multiple different levels, not just your neuromuscular strength, which I often talk about, and that has to do with muscular balance and your structural integrity and your your work capacity, your, yourself as an athlete, yourself as a fully functional walking human being. And I often say and truly believe that your body is your mind. And if you are sick, decrepit, broken down and weak physically, I don't think you'll be able to reach your maximum capacity on a cognitive, mental, spiritual level. So I begin there. I begin with the body, but it goes far beyond that. We're also considering the physiological strength of an individual or the physiological health of an individual. There are organs, there are hormones, uh, the the nervous system, and then ultimately your psychology, the way you think, the stories you tell yourself, the way you carry your body as a manifestation station of the psychological character that you're carrying yourself with. Someone who carries themselves with their head high and they're, and they're on their toes is someone who looks like they're going somewhere. They feel good about themselves. They're moving forward in the world and they're physically moving forward because, you know, they're on their toes and their head is held high. As opposed to someone who's kyphotic, droop forward, head hanging and feet are flat looks like someone who will physically, they're not going very far because you're kind of slopping, a lap, slopping along and if you, if you take a look at where that person is going or where they're coming from or what they feel about themselves in their day-to-day life, be it with relationships or career or school, they're, it's pro- they're probably plodding along also. Sure. Yeah. One of the core concepts here at The Art of Charm is how you do anything is how you do everything. And that has to do with the crossover between the emotional and mental and the physical as well. What I do for a living and what I also train people to do at the Art of Charm, especially when like intelligence agents come in or special forces guys, is how to read people. And one of the things that I can show people how to look for is mental characteristics or emotional characteristics as a result of certain types of body language. And you just touched on that issue as well. When you see somebody slumped over or certain types of eye contact, weak eye contact, weak posture, even the way they hold their feet, you can really learn to read what someone's emotional state is and uh, what they think of their own capabilities and things like that as well. And you can also see when people are suspicious, when they're hiding things, ask any cop, right? They look at somebody and they get that gut feeling. It's not based on their sixth sense. It's based on nonverbal communication that they can't articulate, but that they can see and process. Yeah. People are doing that all the time. We're doing this when it comes to dating, too. Women are very good at it. They're about 10 to 20 times better at it than men are. They just don't know it necessarily. And so that's why guys who have their proverbial shit together can do a lot better with the opposite sex, especially if their physical component is there. It has nothing to do with how big their biceps are and has everything to do with how they carry themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And the way you carry yourself will change the way you think about yourself. Yes. The bo- that's why when I say the body is the mind, it's like you can change your mind by changing the way you carry yourself. There are exercise components to allowing that to happen, stretching the right muscles, 
breathing a particular way, walking a particular way, reducing muscular tension in certain muscles, developing strength in certain muscles that are flaccid and weak that could potentially hold your posture up. You see? Yeah, flaccid's never an attractive word, right? So Absolutely. That impotent, those are two that you definitely don't want to be characterized as. Exactly, exactly. It's funny you should say that the mind is the body because, again, a principle of the Art of Charm, a core principle, is that the body follows the mind and the mind follows the body. So exactly what you were talking about before with mirroring your emotional state. And it, it is very true. I mean, you've got certain types of body movements or sort of physiology that you can use to improve mindset. And, of course, we know that mindset will improve physiology or not improve physiology. Look at someone who's depressed or look at somebody who's in a great mood. The way they carry themselves, it's very apparent. They don't have to come up and tell you that they're depressed, and they certainly don't have to come up and tell you that they're excited about life. It has to do with everything about what they're doing, and you don't have to understand a word of their language. You can tell if uh, somebody who speaks Mandarin Chinese is excited or sad by the way that they carry themselves. You might have trouble discerning between angry uh, especially with the Cantonese people, but I digress here. So your mission is to become the strongest version of yourself that's exactly in line with what we do at The Art of Charm, which is one of the reasons why I decided to have you come on. And you inspire others on the same journey. And so you and I are, are very much in the same role as mentors and role models for people, whether we like it or not. And I think this is important because everybody, as each individual raises his own level of consciousness, as you say, he automatically becomes a beacon of light for others who may have been lost or who might not know the value of their existence. What do you mean by that? I mean, essentially, this is the mentorship role in itself. Well, you said it best before when you said you bring whatever you are to everything that you do. Yes. You got to work with who you are because it's far more important than what you do. I can be totally intelligent verbally and in the abstract about what is required to get a particular type of result for someone, right? I might be very well read. I might have all the degrees next to my name. I might have uh, taken all the courses necessary. And in fact, I happen to be very eloquent in my ability to describe everything that needs to happen. But Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, what you are speaks so loud that I can't hear a word you're saying. Yes. Yes. And, I, and I, I live that. I live that because if I'm inviting you to take action in a particular area in, in your life or to improve in a particular way because I want to see you become self-actualized, I want you to be the strongest version of yourself. I, that's why I'm a coach. I get a kick out of watching people succeed. I myself need to embody that first. Yeah, I agree 100%. If you don't embody it, really it's about leading by example in a lot of ways. The difference here is that we're leading all of those around us whether or not we choose to or not. And you'd mentioning, I think this is amazing, the most unselfish thing that we can do is to become a stronger version of ourselves. Because since we are always leading by example, again, whether we choose to or not, we're either leading people upwards or downwards. So if we become the strongest version of ourselves, we inspire others to do that. Absolutely. That sort of begs the question, what does it mean to become the strongest version of yourself? What do you think about that? I really believe it's a totally subjective experience. And the first place to begin is with the simple question, how's that working out for you? Yes. Yeah. Right? Because I can make all my moral judgments and I could have all my ideals lined up about what it should look like for you. But we're also unique in our own individual ways and our experiences, our DNA, all contribute to who we are. And for me to stand here and say mine is the one and only way and and all other ways are doomed to failure doesn't respect the human being in the way that a human being should be respected. And my main sentiment to proceed from is with a deep and profound level of respect for the other human being. The only thing I ask is that we all be as objective as we possibly can and honest with ourselves. Be realists when the question is posed, how is that working out for you? Not what do you think about these ideas and these morals and these judgments and so on and so forth and who told you and what book says. How's that working out for you? For example, I had a conversation with a guy just a few moments ago, and uh, we were talking about the idea of vegetarianism. Now, I have nothing against being a vegetarian. Absolutely not. In fact, it seems as if, of course, there are cultures 
that are vegetarian cultures and they happen to be very healthy and intelligent in that particular way. But then you've got people who have adopted this idea of vegetarianism because of a book they read or an experience that they had. And it clearly is not working out for them. You just look at their gray skin and their bloodshot eyes and yellow teeth and hair falling out, the weak, frail disposition that they carry themselves with, and they can explain all the reasons why vegetarianism is right. They can be very adamant and convincing about vegetarianism, but one glance at the individual and it's clear, that shit ain't working out for you. Yeah, exactly. Hey guys, I want to take a quick break for a second here. You've heard me talk a lot about taking you to the next level in life, at work, and in your relationships. And you've also thought to yourself, yeah, I do want to up my game. I want to become a better man, a better boyfriend or husband, a better person in general. And my guess is that you've been thinking about this for a long time. Am I right? Well, I'm here to tell you this. Stop thinking. Your chance is now. Do you really need more time, more information, more plans for the future, or do you want to become that guy today? Because the truth is this. You can be the guy who sits around and thinks about becoming better, or you can be the guy who decides that today is the day that he's going to become awesome and take action in that direction. And I want that for you. Why? Because you've already got what it takes. The potential is there even if you don't know it yet. Join me and thousands of guys who've taken action in their lives at theartofcharm.com. All right, let's get back to the show. It's funny, we deal with the same stuff here, you know, again, talking about guys and teaching charisma, and teaching guys how to be the best version of themselves is not an easy task. And I'm sure you get this all the time. Guys will go, I'm really interested in this. This is great. This is really cool. And I go, all right, cool. When are we taking things to the next level? When are you going to put this stuff into action? Well, you know, it's cool, but I don't really need it, you know, because I've got this going for me and I've got that going for me. And like, I don't really need to go to strength camp, Elliot, you know, because I'm pretty buff, man. I got a six pack, you know, I just ran a half marathon, you know, I'm doing OK. And then you're thinking, hmm, that's weird, because he just wrote in saying how all this stuff is so inspiring and how all this stuff is so life changing. But then when I ask him to put his money where his mouth is, it's not quite happening. Where's the disconnect? And that's when I bust out that question. All right. Well, how's that working out for you? And then usually if you get that and you know what I'm talking about, Elliot, when you get that honest answer, they're like, well, it's not really where I want it to be right now. And I I ran a marathon last year and I'm in worse shape and this isn't working. I got some blood work back. That's not so positive. And you know, I got an injury that I caused and I'm doing this. And and then you get to the bottom of things when people are really honest with themselves or honest with you about how's that working out. Right. You know, I use that term becoming the stronger version of yourself with an emphasis on becoming. But I also want to shed light on the fact that there is no final destination except death. And a lot of people, of course, we want to be right. You know, it's a big part of the way our education system has conditioned us is you want to be right and you want to avoid any experience that might lend to failure at all. But life is not that black and white. In fact, life from my short experience here on Earth and the wisdom gathered through many generations, life is a journey. It's a dance. It's something we're doing. And it would be in our best interest, in my opinion, to be objective about where we are, what we've got, how we got here, choosing where we'd like to be, what type of experiences we'd like to have, and proceeding in that direction with full awareness that perhaps I'm going to stumble, I might scrape my knee, it might not work out, but be willing to get up and try again without being so dogmatic and emotionally attached to the particular ideals associated with the journey or the length of the journey that I started on to say, okay, well, time to put that away and and try something else. Sure. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And that sort of leads to my follow-up here, which was what everyone's thinking. Well, great. Okay, guys, got it. How do I become the strongest version of myself. What does this mean? You know, one guy over here runs strength camp. One guy over here runs a charisma school. What am I doing here? Where do I start? Okay, I'm going to take a few steps back and uh, I'm going to give you a very broad answer that might not seem like it makes much sense, but bear with me. Meditation. When I say meditation, I don't necessarily mean there's any fixed form of meditation that you need to engage in. I'm not saying you've got to sit cross-legged. I'm not saying you have to do yoga. I'm not saying you have to do anything that looks anything like what you've been told meditation is. When I use that term meditation, I mean getting out of your own way. 
really, that's what it is. Shutting off the part of you that happens to always get in the way. And that part of you that happens to always get in the way has been labeled many things, including our ego. And our ego is this part of us that has been colored by our experiences, by our conditioning, by what other people have told us we are, other people have told us we should do, so on and so forth. It's the collective baggage that has been laid upon us throughout our lives, probably since conception. There are people that look at it that way. Sure. But there's a time and there's an opportunity available to all of us to turn that off for a moment and get in touch with another part of our intelligence. And I happen to believe that this intelligence is found in our bodies. And when someone says, listen to your heart, I don't think it's purely metaphorical. I don't think it's just a metaphor to say, this guy's got guts, or trust your gut, or listen to your heart. What I truly believe is if we shut off, just ignore for a moment, or temper the chatter happening in our head brain, and consult with our hearts, consult with our guts, develop the courage and the passion associated with each, then the answer for what the strongest version of ourselves or the journey towards the strongest version of ourselves will look like will be revealed. Excellent. So it's all about essentially to sound so cliche by accident and just totally unavoidably, it's all about getting in touch with yourself, but a lot of that has to do with shutting off the noise from the outside through, say, meditation and getting out of your own way. Is that what you mean by that? Absolutely, 100%. Good. Sometimes it's hard to dig through this stuff because a lot of guys listen to you, and I love what you say. That's why you're on the show. But I think a lot of guys listen and go, dude, I have no idea what you're talking about. It sounds great, but what do you even mean? And so it's important to sort of cut through some of the chaff because – it's really easy for guys like you and I to get lost in years of study and realize, oh, there's somebody listening out there that's brand new, right, and is going, huh? I think that one of the best ways to describe meditation is getting out of your own way. Fortunately, any guy who sat there and tried to maintain silence of thought for five minutes knows exactly what we're talking about. You sit down to go, I'm just going to focus on my breathing, and then suddenly you're like, why are pencils yellow? Whose idea was that? Do I consider myself more of a baller or a shot caller? I Wait a minute. Oh, crap. No, no thoughts. No thoughts, right? It's really hard. Uh, and we're always doing that. And you just happen to notice that layer of thought when you try to turn off the conscious layer of thought. That means there's probably like a 100 layers or more of thought that are getting in our way. And we're just letting it happen because we've been letting it happen our whole life. But once you dig through some of that... We can see what our body slash heart truly wants, and then we can get that path that you speak of, right? Oh, absolutely. That's been my experience. It's not because I've read a lot about it and because I happen to like the ideas. I just happen to have used these tools. I've been lucky enough to have people to share them with me, and I've grown, for lack of better terms, addicted to them because without meditation, without exercise, without deep breathing... It just doesn't work for me. Life doesn't go as smoothly as it should when I give up or take a break from those practices. So what about some of the challenges that do impede us on the journey? I mean, you don't have time. You don't know how to do it. We run out of ideas on how to do it. I mean, there's a lot that gets thrown in our way. What are some common challenges that you find guys walking through your doors have? I think the biggest challenge is, of course, I say getting in your own way. But what does that exactly look like? Right. Number one is everybody waits until the stars are aligned before they take action. Now, when I say that metaphorically, of course, but we want all the information, we want all the ideas, we want all the know-how before we get started with something. We want the blueprint. We want it all laid out. We want the perfect plan for action before we do anything. And we want security, we want safety. And that's really what the figment of our imagination that's stimulated when we have the plan laid out, the foolproof plan is providing for us or giving us the illusion of. Another Emerson quote, because I love Emerson so damn much. All right. His words have just been so instrumental in my life, is this. Do the thing and you will have the power. And that basically means don't wait until you seemingly have the power because no power is granted you without experience. Go and do the thing you're afraid to do. Go and do that thing. Wait a second, but I don't know. It doesn't matter. But wait, what about this, so on and so forth? It really doesn't matter. 
Go do it. Put one foot on the journey first and then begin to feel your way down that road. And that requires, like we discussed earlier, being in touch with yourself. I think that any goal that we set for ourselves, any journey that we decide to go on is far less about what we attain. It's far less about achieving the goal. It's far less about getting to the end of the journey and more about who we become as we're moving along that path. And the reason why that happens is because we've got to be very sensitive about who we are and where we're going and the choices we make and self-reflection and objectivity. It brings up an excellent point because a lot of people do this. They don't start until they're ready. But the problem is everybody who's successful that you will ever talk to probably in your whole life has always started before they were ready. It's something that I find with all of the entrepreneurs that come on the show, all of the experts that come on this show, all of my successful friends in my quote unquote offline life, if you will, and I'm sure you've seen this as well, Elliot, we always start before we're ready. Did you open a gym when you were 100% confident, sure that it was going to be a success and you knew that you couldn't fail and you knew everything about running a gym? Hell no. (laughs) You started when you opened the doors and you went, all right, hopefully this doesn't drive me into oblivion bankruptcy, right? Yeah, let's see what's going to happen. And you learn in the process. At the end of the day, sure, the journey might lead somewhere, but at the end of the day, you take the lessons and not the spoils. That's the true gift. The true gift are the lessons you learn along the way and the character that you develop as you navigate the path. And we mentioned before a little bit about breathing. And one of the things that we both share that this is actually one of the comments that got my attention because we say the same thing when we teach vocal tonality at the Art of Charm, we teach breathing from your balls or breathing into your balls, you say the same thing. I think we probably mean the same thing, but I'll I'll have you explain it if you don't mind because guys don't really understand what it means to breathe deeply. They don't really understand what it means to breathe from your balls. That idea was first shared with me through Alexander Lowen, who was a student of Wilhelm Reich. And Wilhelm Reich was a student of Sigmund Freud. And, and Wilhelm Reich was an interesting dude because as a student of Freud's, He studied psychoanalysis, of course, and he was a psychoanalyst. And he began work by having his client lay on a bed or a couch and they would talk. And that's how psychoanalysis began. And that's how many do it still today. But this interesting guy, Wilhelm Reich, who if you Google him, you'll see all types of weird and interesting things about him. He's kind of a crazy dude. One of the crazy things that he said that I fully embraced is that you learn far more about the psychological ills and pains that you're patient has by watching him breathe than listening to him talk. And that sort of points back to the original idea that you are what you are speak so loudly, I can't hear a word you say. We we become so good at posturing that the vision of an individual can be clouded by the amount of words or the eloquence and their ability to, to speak. We've convinced ourselves and tricked ourselves to such a degree that we can get other people to drink our Kool-Aid as well. But what Reich was saying is, I'm not interested in listening to my patients speak. In fact, just lay there and breathe. And he began just being very enrolled in watching what he called the respiratory wave of the individual. And that means how the softness of your torso allows the wave from your perineum down. Guys, I think we call it a tank. Yes, we do. Because we're classy <laughs> like that, right? Right? It taint your balls and it taint your asshole. So it's somewhere in between there. I was that how that got coined. Even classier. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, of course, he's not watching their balls. But and Alexander Lowen, who ended up being a mentor of mine, they would ask their patients to take their shirts off and to wear, like, you know, bicycle shorts. You could literally watch from the pelvis or all the way up into the face, the facial musculature, across the eyes, across the jaw, the neck, the chest, the belly, the pelvic floor. He recognized that there were certain bands of what he called muscular armoring across those particular areas, the eyes, the jaw, the neck, shoulders, chest, belly, pelvic floor. And the therapy consisted of Healing a person's psychological ills, and and trust, we all have psychological ills due to trauma that we experience just by being a part of civilization. I mean, we're we're caged animals in that way. So we've all been traumatized. It's not a matter of were you uh, abused or were you in an accident or you're a war veteran. It's a matter of we live in civilization. it's It's traumatizing to the physiology of the human being. 
the therapy consisted of, and, and Alexander Lowen took it a bit further, it consisted of helping the individual reduce the muscular tension in those bands of muscular armoring. A person who didn't have the tension across the eyes, because believe it or not, your eyes and your jaw play a, a significant role in your ability to breathe deeply. We might not think so because we tend to think that it's just the lungs, but you're breathing from your entire body, from the tip of your head down to your your tailbone. It's all breathing. You're, you, you, we're a breathing organism. When there's no muscular tension and the structural integrity is, is integrous, you know, you, you, everything lined up perfectly, properly, you breathe so deeply and softly that your pelvic floor expands. There's a really interesting book called Embryonic Breathing and Qigong Meditation. And in that book, I think that's one of the reasons why I started saying breathe into your balls. The technique was to begin breathing so much that you could actually feel your balls drop with your inhalation. And the reason why your balls would drop is because you're so soft in your torso that when your diaphragm expands, when it drops, it pushes your stomach, your colon, all your organs down into your pelvic floor. And your pelvic floor is so soft that it allows those organs to sort of push down on the perineum, down into your pelvic floor. That is a person who is soft from the tip of their head to their tailbone. And when they breathe, they're really accessing all of what's available to us on multiple different levels, physiologically, psychologically, neuromuscularly. Okay. Wow. This requires some sort of work as well. You can't just start off doing it. All right, let's take a quick time out for a sec. Some people think the Art of Charm boot camps and programs are just about picking up girls. And honestly, there's some of that. One week with us and you'll be rocking out in that department, I promise. But as a guy, I know how important it is to be awesome and well-rounded. And not just awesome with girls. Awesome at work, awesome at home, awesome with your friends and family. Guys really need to step it up everywhere. And that's why we call our company the Art of Charm. That special something that gets you results wherever you go. And trust me, the results are real. Every day I get new emails and calls from the guys who decided to take our boot camp, and what I hear is simply amazing. Just weeks after graduating, they land a promotion, they form a new wolf pack, start a new business, or even find a partner. They have a new life, and it's not an accident. Find out why at theartofcharm.com. All right, let's get back to the good stuff. How do we start to destroy the muscular tension that blocks that type of breathing? I mean, you've got some bioenergetics. I don't even know what that necessarily is, but there's got to be some stretching, some exercises that guys can do because I know that it's not just as easy as cracking the back and getting to work on that stuff. No. And I tell you, in my experience, it's an ongoing, never ending process of adjusting to civilization, adjusting to life by using deep breathing, stretching, exercising. I, there's one that I would like to share with you, one exercise in particular. It's called the bow. And it essentially requires that you stand on your two feet. There are several variations of them, but one which is like the most aggressive is to raise your hands straight up in the air, spread your fingers as wide as you can, open your mouth as wide as you can. And that's the toughest one for most people. I mean, just stretch your jaw open and then begin leaning backwards as far as you can and breathing in that position. You, most people, if they have a high charge, most men with high charge will start vibrating. They'll either start choking and having to figure out how to breathe in this stress position, or the whole body starts vibrating and shaking uncontrollably, and, and most people freak out. But the idea is to allow that to happen because it's essentially your desire to breathe in that stressful position. It's fighting against the muscular tension in your belly, in your chest, in your neck, in your face, in your throat and pelvic floor. And it's very uncomfortable. Yet it's also very powerful. And after a few minutes of doing it, you'll know that you're breathing deeper simply because your voice will get deeper because there's no tension in your throat any longer, in, in your chest and in your belly. And you'll just feel very calm and, and grounded and relaxed and focused. That's one form of a bioenergetic yoga type exercise that would support you in being able to breathe into your balls. You know, it seems like that would be something that would be important for us to carry and, and practice on the daily and not get frustrated with as well. But not all of us are patient, and I know you didn't start off being patient as well. Let's back up the truck way up and talk about how you got to the point 
where you decided that physical strength being inseparable from emotional and mental strength was even important in the first place? Because you were doing strongman stuff. You took a lot of angles and, and advantages that ended up biting you in the ass and bringing you to the realization that this stuff is crucial and is actually possibly as important or more important than the physical component itself, right? See, the body is the mind. It is the physical component. Your psychology and your psychological character, the way you carry yourself psychologically, is it's a chicken or an egg situation. Right. Your body is going to dictate how you feel about yourself, and how you feel about yourself is going to dictate how you carry your body. It's one of the same, and I've always been a body person. Like I described earlier, I've always been into exercise. I've always been into physical fitness. I've always been into sports. I've, my focus has always been on the body. There was a point in which I became kind of depressed. I was probably about 23 years old. And in my experience, 23 years on earth is one of those transition periods in life where you're posed with a lot of different options and ambiguity about where to go and what to do. And uh, we start growing up, but not sure if we're men yet or all these different things that kind of converge at the age of 23 that I see in a lot of my clients and the questions that come in. I went through a slight bout of depression, but you know, not the type where I'm going to stay there. I'm, I'm never the type to stay anywhere too long, especially if it doesn't feel good. And I started studying meditation. I came across the ideas of a man named Osho, also known as Rajneesh. And uh, he's long passed away now, but his whole mission in life was to bring meditation to the West. And he's done a tremendous job in doing that. But it wasn't so simple as, well, sit down and meditate, right? He realized that the Western mind body has far more charge than the Easterns where a lot of these ideas first came from. And it might be easy to tell someone growing up in the Indian culture, you know, typically of the traditional Indian culture, well, you meditate. Well, of course, yeah. Or to tell someone from the traditional Chinese culture, well, you've got to do Qigong, you've got to do Tai Chi. Well, of course, I mean, they do it every day. It's a part of the, the culture. But to come to the West where we're very uh, yang, we're very aggressive, we're very heady to say, well, now you've got to sit down and meditate. You're going to shut your brain off. Didn't seem to work. You know, it's, it's kind of a difficult thing to tell most Westerners, especially Western men, American men, well, now go meditate without seeming as if you're castrating yourself. Right. Especially given the religion of science in the West, where we essentially respect only that which can be calculated or counted. Right. What he decided or discovered, and he was also a, a big fan of Wilhelm Reich. I think Reich died before he did. The guy was not just a mystic, but he was a university professor, and he taught psychology and uh, philosophy. So he was well-read, and he understood quite a bit. And he devised a form of meditation very similar to bioenergetics. Bioenergetics is a term I use to describe a lot of this. He called it active meditation. Active meditation, if I could describe it briefly, is basically get all your sillies out. My children watch a show called Yo Gabba Gabba, where they teach children. You know, there's one segment in the show where they put on a song that says, get your sillies out, shake your sillies out. And children basically shake their face and head and they jump around and they shake their body and they, they laugh or they just they start throwing things around. Like My kids will just like they'll roll and do backflips and they just go nuts. Just go nuts for a little while because there's so much tension and you know this with children there's so much tension in their bodies because they're so active there's so much energy and aliveness and vitality that they just have to get it out and if you don't as we get older of course we get more conditioned by society and we have more shame in our body but the necessity for physical release for, for catharsis if you will for shaking your sillies out never goes away you see, so it, yeah. I've got four children, so they're, they're far more grounded, they're far more centered, they're far more available after bouts of physical activity. It's namely unstructured physical movement like shaking your sillies out. So anyway, active meditation, dynamic meditation appealed to me because I'm a body person and I saw that, well, there's this meditation where you basically just, you've got 15 minutes to go nuts and do whatever you want. Granted, you're not hurting another person in the room or, you know, hurting yourself, but you just, you shut off your brain and shake your sillies out. So I, I went to a class in New York City and for 21 days, you do this form of dynamic meditation and a significant portion of it was shaking your sillies out. And he called it catharsis. 
And I got involved in that way and it felt tremendous. It felt great. I felt like a new person. The, the whole sense of being depressed has left me because I was breathing deeper. My body was softer. I just felt tremendous. I felt good. So I started delving a little bit deeper and I found that there are psychoanalysts, there are practitioners they're not necessarily respected by the medical community you know, for one reason, perhaps right. because you can't sell these as uh, medication. So there's no need to, to do studies. You know. Right. There's no empirical studies. There's no clinical trials. There's no way to set it up. It's all anecdotal. So, yes, it becomes pseudoscience, which does not mean that it's complete bullshit. And although often it does. I tend to be open in that way. And I got the benefits from the dynamic meditation so I decided to delve a little deeper. I worked with a practitioner, and here was my experience. And, of course, this is anecdotal. Um, I make <laughs> no claims about anything here. This is my caveat. These things have helped me. I'd like to share it with you in hopes that perhaps it may be resourceful and helpful to you. If not, that's fine. I'm not trying to say I'm right. I'm not saying this is true. And I'm not saying everyone should believe me or do it themselves. I just happen to have gained from it. And I got a big mouth, so I have to share. The lady was a neo practitioner. And I walk into her office. And the very first thing she does is she puts me into a variation of the bow, which is an exercise I described earlier. And uh, very stressful. I've never done this before in my life. I start vibrating and shaking. And then she invites me to go over to a mattress on the floor. She invites me to proceed in humping the mattress. She says, just grab the top of the mattress and just start jamming it with your hips like you're humping it. And she just continued to provoke me and say, just do it harder, harder, harder. You know, I'm like, what the fuck's going on? Yeah, but I just right. Do it anyway. You're looking for the video camera, like what is happening right now? Uh, and then I break into laughter. I break into this deep, laughter, the type children do, or you might experience when you smoke too much marijuana, or you're just laughing and your mm -hmm. belly hurts, you just can't stop. Tears are coming to your eyes. You're just It's such a pleasurable feeling. I'm humping the mattress, I start laughing, and I couldn't stop laughing, I couldn't stop crying, and I, and I couldn't even catch my breath, and I start apologizing to her, saying, look, I, I'm sorry, I know that this is a therapy session, and, um, I can't stop laughing, I don't know what's going on, and she smiles and says, that's okay. That's exactly what's supposed to happen. After I gather myself, after several minutes of laughing deeply from my belly, she explains, she says, now listen, I want to know what happened here. And she says to me that at some point, someone told you that you're not a good boy if you feel pleasurable feelings. You're either told to, to sit down and shut up and to stop playing you know, having fun when we're not supposed to have fun because you're in church or you're in school or whatever the case may be. And the particular area of your body, your hips, showed signs of muscular rigidity due to an experience you may have had. Now, she said, I can't tell you exactly what that experience was at this particular time, but your body told me that this is where you had tension. And all I did was I gave you an exercise to help break up the muscular tension in that particular area. When the laughter broke out, it was a sign of emotional release and a regaining of the character associated with allowing pleasure to happen in your body. And this is sort of the way she explained it to me. Sure. And uh, I, I felt really good. And I figured, well, this is awesome. I, I wonder, I did that one session with her. I, didn't, I never went back. But one of the long lasting effects that I experienced was that ever since that moment and that session, I would have sex with my wife, and at the end, I would break down into laughter, joyful laughter. My whole body would just vibrate with laughter. First, my wife was like, what the hell is going yeah, on? Yeah, I was going to say, the first time that happened, probably not a good effect on the wife. No, she was like, what's this? And I explained to her what happened the, the day before, and I knew that something had changed in me deeply at that point. Now, I didn't have much time because I was busy trying to get my life started, and I started a business and was moving and so on and so forth. So I didn't spend too much time studying it. Years later, probably about three years ago, I started doing more research, and, and I came across the ideas of Wilhelm Reich, Alexander Lowen. I began working with one of Lowen's students by the name of Bob Glazier, who lives in Florida, and started a, a process of therapy that he called bioenergetics, where there were ex similar exercises. He would do certain things like put me into stress positions where I'd be forced to breathe even though it was uncomfortable. There would be some neuromuscular 
trigger point therapy, you'd press on my chest or press on my head or press deeply into my belly, like towards my belly button or to the left and right of it. And I would experience this release of emotional catharsis. I would scream or I'd yell or I'd cry. I would spend hours crying there. So my experience with the results of the therapy was that I started making better choices in my business. My relationship with my wife and children had improved. My athletic ability had improved. I actually began looking different and my voice changed. The physical changes associated with the exercise also led to all the character gems that I just described. My business exploded thereafter. That was about the same time that my YouTube channel went from about 100,000 people to now almost 900,000. I had become a stronger version of myself, and I attribute a lot of it to these exercises that change not just my body, my ability to breathe, but also my character, who I see myself to be. Excellent. And that sort of proves that emotional, that physical and spiritual component are always inseparable. They are the same thing. Working on the tension that you had in your body led to changes directly in your mind that you can attribute directly to changes in your body. In fitness, there's a phrase that we like to use. And, uh, and it's the same phrase that it is repeated over and over again in bioenergetic or body psychology therapy uh, circles. But that is form equals function. And it's pretty likely everybody agrees. They shake their head. Well, form equals function. Yes, you know, you can only perform the way the structure is formed. Even with regard to cars, like you're not going to get a Jeep Wrangler to, to run like a Maserati. But also the way you carry yourself, that has a direct impact on your psychology. So the way that you behave, the way that your body's put together will have a direct impact on your psychology. Carry yourself with your chest dropped, you know, your sternum dropped, and your, your head looking down for a day. You're not going to feel very energetic or happy about yourself. And people aren't going to behave towards you in a way that's respectful. But put a spring in your step. You know, sort of bounce on your toes when you're walking. Keep your head up high. Look at people in their eyes. And you're going to experience a totally different psychological state. Excellent. It goes back to the mind following the body and the body following the mind. A lot of people think it's woo-woo. It's really not. It is based on science, not just Eastern science, but yes, some pseudoscience in there. But all people need to do to figure it out is to observe and to see how their own physiology affects their emotional state. More from Elliot at HullsStrength.com. And of course, that's H-U-L-S-E, and that'll be linked up in our show notes as well. Elliot, thanks so much, man. There's a reason you have 900,000 plus YouTube followers. We'll be linking to your channel as well in the show notes so that people can go and subscribe there too. Cool, man. I appreciate it. It was a fun show. Perhaps play a little game called Just a Tip. Just for a second, just to see how it feels. Hey, this is Jordan Harbinger, host of the Art of Charm podcast, the number one dating and relationship advice podcast in iTunes. I'm Emily Morris, host of the Sex with Emily podcast, the number one sex and relationship podcast on iTunes and at sexwithemily.com. And this is just the tip. All right, so you mentioned earlier like, oh, the brain's the biggest erogenous zone, and it's totally like a cliche thing that everybody's heard. But what are some erogenous zones that guys might not ever think about? You I'm know, so you, glad you asked that because really most men only think of like, you know, the breasts and yeah, the down and under. They right. never think about Those are else. my favorite erogenous zones. Exactly, yeah. and we all know those are your favorite yeah. erogenous zones. So I'm here to tell you that a lot of women have erogenous zones that you uh, had no idea existed. You and tell. you should make it your life's work to find out what her other erogenous zones are. For example, the earlobes, very sensitive to some women. Just you touch Touch them, kiss them, gently bite the earlobes. Since it shivers down her spine, every woman I know. But Poke guys, you will like them on the first and put jewelry date. in there. Exactly. Or buy her diamonds. Yeah. True. Pierce her ears. Um, collarbone. A lot of men's like find collarbones irresistible. Why not touch it and kiss it? Um, mm. Unbutton her shirt little. Touch that spot. Make circles with your tongue. Give no her problem. love bites. Yeah. Yeah. Thighs. Touch her thighs before you go in for the treats, okay? Massage her thighs, lick her, tease her, use your tongue, drag it around her thighs, massage, and then go in for it. I'm telling you, it'll turn around. She'll be begging you for it. Nice. All right. Anything else? Oh, how much time do we have? We have. Feet. <laughs> Give her a foot massage. Every woman dreams of a foot massage. You put extra pressure on her toes and ankles aside of her feet, and um, she'll be putting your hands for whatever you want. Nice. Next. 
If you guys want to learn more from The Art of Charm about dating, relationships, and even networking for business, visit us at theartofcharmpodcast.com or check us out in iTunes and follow me on Twitter at The Art of Charm. And check out the Sex with Emily podcast at sexwithemily.com and on iTunes if you want to have the best sex of your life, that is. Also, follow me on Twitter at Sex with Emily. All right, show feedback and guest suggestions. We rely on you guys to help keep our finger on the pulse. So if you know someone who's a good fit for the show, let us know at jordanh at theartofcharm.com. Boot camp details for our live programs also at theartofcharm.com, and that's where you're going to find links to us on Twitter, Facebook, and other social media as well. If you're listening to this but you're not subscribed in iTunes or Stitcher or something like that, then that needs to change. Getting our shows delivered free to your phone or computer is the best way to make sure you don't miss a thing. You can do that by going to iTunes and searching for The Art of Charm Podcast or by going to theartofcharm.com slash iTunes and clicking subscribe. That's really it. And you guys can help us. Subscribe in iTunes and give us a five-star rating. Write something nice and we will love you forever. Just go to iTunes.com slash The Art of Charm and it'll take you right there. When you write us a review, it not only makes us feel proud, but it helps keep us up in the ranks so that other people who can use this information can find the show more easily to get the credible advice that they need. It's also the best way to support the show other than purchasing products and training from us. So tell your friends because the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to someone else either in person or shared on the web. Now have a great week, go out there and get social, and leave everything better than you found it.